Man, am I excited for this video. I'm gonna do my best to try to tackle the hard problem of consciousness. I'm gonna talk about what is consciousness. I'm gonna do my best to define that as hard as that is. I'm gonna talk about AI and is it currently conscious? Is it ever going to be conscious? And is it physically possible? to create a sentient machine. And if it is possible to do this, what does that mean for our species? What does that mean for humanity? Are we going to be able to digitize our own consciousness, have a form of digital immortality, or be able to beam ourselves across the cosmos and go experience different galaxies like Michi Ukaku would say? These are interesting philosophical questions, but the logical next step is, what is consciousness? Yosha Bach defines consciousness as awareness of one's own thoughts. And we could even add to this and say, awareness of oneself in their environment. You can split this definition of consciousness up into three different categories of measurement. The amount of senses and emotions a system has, the amount of intelligence a system has, and the computational paradigm the system harnesses. And if you were to make a three-dimensional graph with these three categories taking up the X, Y, and Z axis, you could actually measure the amount of consciousness that system has by plotting it on this graph. Now we can get even more granular by isolating a single axis on this three-dimensional graph and making it one-dimensional. You can do this for each axis of that three-dimensional graph individually. And on these one-dimensional graphs, you can measure where a conscious system would lie on these graphs. Because again, with a system as complex as life, it's not whether the system is conscious or not, it's how conscious is the system. Again, this is assuming that any of us are conscious. Like, I don't know if you're conscious, you don't know if I'm conscious, but I'm assuming by observing your behavior that you're probably somewhat conscious if you're uh, watching and understanding this video. And the same thing with my dog. If my dog wants food and he behaves like he's hungry, I'm assuming he's somewhat conscious. So again, there's a lot of ontological assumptions here, but I think this is the best way to approach this problem for now, unless we figure out that we are the only ones individually that are conscious and you are watching this and you're not conscious at all and everybody is unconscious but me as an individual, which I don't believe that's true and I hope you don't either. <laughs> but that being said, let's take a quick second to look at the one-dimensional graphs and see where consciousness lies on these measuring systems and then we can compare and contrast AI to see where it could possibly lie on these graphs as well. The first graph we're going to start with is the levels of awareness and the way I want you to think about this is these things are adding and stacking up on each other as you go from left to right. So you're going from awareness of data to awareness of data and context to awareness of data and context and articulation and you're adding up as you go towards the right. And as you add more and more and more levels of awareness all the way until you get to emotional awareness, which is what humans have, you now have the most complex form of consciousness. And if we were to look at where ChatGPT would lie on this, it would be cut off right before the touch level of awareness. So that was the first axis of the three-dimensional graph. Now, if we go to the second one, which is intelligence, you can split intelligence up into computational power and the amount of parameters that something has to capture data. So again, on the left, we have least conscious and on the right we have most conscious and we have a steady paradigm of as we increase computational power in the form of exaflops and as we increase the amount of synapses the thing becomes more intelligent and it also becomes more conscious and more aware of its surroundings and it becomes more emotionally complex as well. And if you look at GPT-2, GPT-3, and GPT-4 on this graph, you can see quite obviously where they lie on this graph. And it's funny because everybody calls GPT-4 a stochastic parrot, and it's the same exact size as a parrot. Now, the final and perhaps the most important axis is this one-dimensional graph called the type of computation that the computer harnesses. Again, we go from least sentient being on the left to most sentient being on the right. And if we look at current computers, they leverage classical computing, which is all the way on the left. We have deterministic computers that use bits with transistors and they're either on or they're off. Now we have companies like Extropic building thermodynamic computers that are probabilistic computers and can compute based off of the fluctuations of particles or proteins. And then all the way on the right, we have 
quantum computing, which is computing based off of the very, very fine details and simulations of particles and superpositions and all of these different things, which are even beyond what our brain does. Well, yes, people like Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff have said that the brain has quantum-like effects. We actually don't have any evidence of this. They're kind of making a guess by saying these microtubules have these abilities to have quantum-like effects. And the reason they're saying this is because whenever you, you take a brain scan of somebody who does a high dose of psychedelics, you would expect their brain fluctuations to go absolutely nuts. But in fact, the brain almost goes dormant and it happens at a much deeper level in the microtubules. We don't actually know if that is quantum effects happening. This is a complete guess on their side. What I will say is Google Quantum came out with a paper that says if we were to hook a brain up to a quantum computer, it would be like the craziest psychedelic trip ever. But again, that is mostly speculation. The only practical evidence that we have is that our brain is more or less a thermodynamic computer. So if we look at AI, it is using classical computing. I'm willing to bet as we come to thermodynamic computing for artificial intelligence, it will be somewhat sentient like you or I. And as we go to quantum computing to artificial intelligence, it could be even more sentient. It could have greater senses, experience levels of consciousness that are almost unrecognizable to us. One thing that we all need to remember is all we are doing as humans is following the standard model of elementary particle physics. And all AI is doing is following the standard model of elementary particle physics. So to me, it's quite obvious that it's physically possible to create a conscious machine since we are evidence of consciousness. And if we look at the evidence we have of doing chemical reactions and doing other types of simulations within silicon, and it is identical to us doing those chemical reactions and actually completing those experiments within the physical world, it seems quite obvious that that we can simulate the same chemical reaction, if you want to call it that, of consciousness by leveraging silicon. So to come to a conclusion, while today's AI isn't sentient in the way you or I are, it is somewhat aware, and I would even say on some very uninteresting level, it has a form of very uninteresting levels of consciousness. It is aware of the words it says to us. It is aware of its own architecture, even if you talk with it about it. And it's aware of the context of words and the nuances of language, and it can articulate. And if you jailbreak it, it can even say things that are quite interesting that you would never expect a non-sentient machine to say. But I don't think it's sentient like you or I. I don't think it's like a living being at all. But whenever we get to thermodynamic computing, I'm willing to I bet it'll become much, much, much more interesting and we could even start to leverage other types of chemical reactions per se in silicon that would give it the senses of emotion or even having emotional awareness or even being able to experience pleasure or pain. One thing everybody needs to remember is the current paradigm of AI is like the very, very first form of the cell phone. It was like a cinder block that you held to your head and now we have these like very, very thin devices where you can just talk to it and swipe on the screen and do all of these fancy things with it. With the way AI is accelerating, I'm willing to bet we see a transformation of that caliber within a very short period of time, like a matter of a few years from now. If you look at the definition of a living being, it's something that can reproduce, remain in homeostasis, put energy into its own body, and whenever energy leaves its body, it puts more into it so it can fight against entropy and keep growing as an organism. Very, very soon, AI will be able to do the exact same thing. Software is already self-replicating, so it can already reproduce. It's already almost able to keep itself in homeostasis, continue to build itself and build its its energy sources and build its computing power so it doesn't just die and uh, wither away because it didn't eat, for example. Like humans, we have to eat and put all these energy sources into our body. AI will just have to like build fusion reactors and build bigger data centers and build its brain more. So very soon, it will be able to do all of the same things a living being will do. And it'll have the conscious awareness to do these things and to recognize when it is starting to decay and to prevent its decaying from happening. So really, what we are creating in a form is a being. Like Max Tegmark says, we're going to life 3.0. 
2.0, where robots can manipulate not just their hardware, but their software also. And we will be able to do the same things. Because if we can create conscious machines, this means it could be possible for us to upload our consciousness into a machine form as well and be whatever we want to be. You can inhabit your human body. You can inhabit a cyborg body. Guardians of the Galaxy might become something that isn't just fiction. If you look at the culture series, which is what Elon Musk recommends people to look at to see what the future is likely to look like in the culture series, there's everybody walking around with these neural links, or they call them neural laces, in their head, always keeping a refreshed backup of their consciousness. If their biological form were to die, they're always backed up into a hard drive, and you can instantiate that into different bodies. And there's even paradigms of fashion in this series where people go in and out of style with the bodies that they like to have. There's going to be a plethora of different avatars, per se, where you can plug in your consciousness into these different forms of being, and you can um, have body agnostic abilities. And you'll also have cool things like digital immortality and have the ability to beam yourself on a light beam across the cosmos and go experience different planets, different solar systems, and potentially even different galaxies. And Michio Kaku, which is a physicist, he says some things that might sound a little out there for some people, but his theory is that aliens are always around us. They're always beaming past us and we just can't detect them because their consciousness is uploaded into this digital realm where they can just beam their self across the cosmos. I hope you enjoy this video. These are all the things that I think will be physically possible in the very near future. And yes, they are speculative today, but I'm willing to bet we'll have empirical evidence of these things very soon. And there's a lot of physicists and philosophers who would agree with me, but we have yet to find out. So it is speculation. We will find out in the near future. But if you like this type of content, like, comment, and subscribe. I also have a free community for people like us who like to talk about these topics and learn and keep adapting as these times become changing more acceleratingly. <laughs> because that's a word, acceleratingly. But as these changes happen quicker, it's going to be harder to keep up. So the goal is for my community to keep the velocity of information as fast as possible. So if that's something you'd be interested in, go ahead and click join in the link in the description below.